This week, we continue our look at how we love and serve our Lord and one another using the gift we have already received in and through Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at how in loving, as we are loved, we serve. And how lives are changed because of us doing so. While well, most believe loving one another in this way is doable, although sometimes complicated, the way to serve I bring to the forefront today will be a bit more challenging. Today I contend that to forgive, we serve. To forgive. When we have been wrong, seems like such a tall hill to climb, especially when the wrong hurts those we know, those we love, or somehow breaks a trust that we have shared in, re in our relationship. But this is something Jesus asks us, in fact, Jesus says we must do. In Matthew's Gospel account, Jesus tells Peter this story of a king who wants to settle his accounts with his servants. And one of his servants owes the king a great sum of money. And he can't repay it. And in a last ditch effort to avoid the consequences of his choices, this man begs the king for mercy, promising to one day repay that debt. But seeing this man repent, the king doesn't just give him more time to repay. He forgives the debt completely. Unfortunately, this man does not do likewise when someone who owes him a very small amount of money is unable to pay. And in doing so, he, he faces the wrath of that same king. Not because of the money he had owed, but because of his failure to show the same mercy he had just received. And I can imagine Peter, who we all know to be a little stubborn and sometimes even a little confrontational, <clears throat> rolling his eyes in that this man's debt was forgiven in the first place. But the point Jesus was making is that when there is true repentance, mercy will be found. And just as we are forgiven our wrongs, we must also forgive the wrongs of others. And I might add, of ourselves too. I, like Peter, we, we struggle to see how some people can be forgiven. Especially when what they have done seems to us to be so atrocious. I, I remember back in seminary, a classmate of mine Knowing my military connection, very early in our time together, learned of my strong dislike for Jane Fonda. And he asked me, if she was a member of my parish, could I forgive her? And I said, no. I could not. Any forgiveness she was to know needed to come from God. Things she said and did were an anathema to everything I believed was right. And if some of the reports of what she did were true, I didn't know how she could be forgiven. At the beginning of my second and third year in seminary, this same classmate would ask me the same question. And I would give him the same answer. And one morning we were on the golf course, we're closing in on graduation, so we kind of used our morning prayer time for golf. <laughs> we're out on the golf course that morning, and it wasn't too long after we had studied this very story out of Matthew's Gospel account. And he asked me, 
That question, could I forgive her? My response this time was, I must. I must. Not because I thought she deserved it, because I still didn't. But because if her repentance was true, as she professed, she'd already been forgiven. Who was I to judge what God set aside? I wonder if Philemon would have responded likewise when getting this letter from his friend Paul, asking him, out of the love that they share for one another, love that arises out of their relationship in Christ, to forgive somebody who had done him wrong. And I'm not talking about someone who simply hurt Philemon's feelings, but someone whose actions likely not only broke the trust Philemon had in him, but could easily have placed his life, if not his well-being, in jeopardy if he were to return to Philemon. Onesimus, in our reading today, is described as a slave, a house servant, who may have run away, we don't know, or whose actions so displeased his owner that he was sent away to serve somewhere else. Either way, he winds up in Rome, and in the house in which Paul is being held until his trial. And while with Paul, Onesimus turns his life around and apparently grieves the harm he may have caused. And then for some unexplained reason, Paul is deciding to send him back to Philemon. Most likely, to protect him from Roman judgment as a follower of Christ, which he hadn't been before, or possibly even a co-conspirator of Paul's. Having witnessed this transformational power of God's love in the life of Onesimus, Paul asks Philemon to welcome him back into his household. Now, if Paul had stopped there in his request, I doubt this letter would have made it into the New Testament. But, but like my seminary friend, he asked Philemon to do something else. He asks him to forgive Onesimus for whatever it is he had done. And, and how does, and not only that, but to welcome him not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. How does Philemon respond? The letter doesn't tell us. We don't know what Philemon's expression was when he receives this harebrained request from Paul. Whether he was angry or whether or not he was gladly doing as he was asked. However, what we do know is found in chapter 4 of Paul's letter to the Colossians, where we hear that Onesimus, now a, traveling with a trusted envoy of Paul's named Tychius, is described as Paul by Paul as, as a faithful and beloved brother. And who is, he tells the Colossians, one of their own. In today's world, we, we often hear, forgive, but never forget. The point Paul is making is that unless we forget, we never really forgive. To forgive is to let go. If we never let go, if we carry that memory of the hurt that has been placed upon us, or those we love, if we carry that around with us everywhere we go, then the forgiveness we professed was not real. And how do we know this is the case? How do we know if we're not quite there? If whenever we see or talk about the person who hurt, who did the wrong, 
we get this uncomfortable feeling in our heart. We see yellow or red flags starting to fly in the breeze. Or we feel that we need to back ourselves up against the wall. Then there's a good chance. Good chance that the forgiveness we offered fell short of the forgiveness that has been afforded us in our wrongs. In today's gospel reading, Jesus says, None can be his disciples unless they give up all their possessions. And when we hear this, we, we often think of all of our worldly things, our stuff. Stuff that seems so important. But, but Jesus is adding in something else, too. He's talking about that spiritual baggage that each of us carries. <clears throat> things that, just like worldly things can keep us from knowing and living in the peace that God's love offers. When we learn, and what we learn in the story, Jesus tells in Matthew, and in the letter Paul writes to Philemon, is that knowing forgiveness in our lives, we are to let go of those things that have happened. Things that have broken our trust in one another or that hurt those we know or love. Because if we don't, the pain we suffer only builds as hate and resentment festers within us. Who is it that we think is beyond forgiveness? we feel does not deserve it. Whoever they are, even if they are ourselves, know this, none, none are beyond forgiveness that is offered out of the love we share in and through Jesus Christ. To know forgiveness the only string that is attached is that we are sorry for the things we have done. Of course, sometimes we don't know that we do things unless somebody tells us. Because, folks, let's admit it, we all wander through life inadvertently causing pain we don't know. And while it's easier for us to forgive those who say they are sorry, we must never forget we are to forgive even those who don't. If Jesus could do that as he hung on the cross, should we not also strive to do that in our own lives? When we find it in ourselves to forgive, just as when we love, lives are changed. Theirs and ours as the transformative power of God's love takes away those burdens that weigh so heavily on our hearts, freeing us, freeing us to enjoy the peace God's love offers to all in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.